honored guests, ladies and gentlemen. I am honored uh, by the very kind invitation to speak at your 61st annual conference. And I must say that the president and members of council deserve our commendation for convening this virtual conference of our leading economists across the country against all odds. Clearly, COVID-19 has lost the battle to technological ingenuity and the human will. The theme of this annual conference, the African Continental Free Trade Area in the post-COVID-19 era, what next for Nigeria, is particularly apt. The outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic and the accompanying global economic shutdown could not have come at a worse time for the African continental free trade area. Because trading was to have started on the 1st of July 2020, this has meant a delay in reaping some of the expected benefits of the, of the free trade agreement. The theme is also relevant because the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted negatively on almost all African countries and will have lasting effects on several economic sectors and activities. It's therefore incumbent on Nigeria as the largest economy in the free trade area and with possibly the largest assemblage of the finest economic minds to begin to think through what all these developments mean for us nationally and regionally. The AFTA is expected to bring about a number of benefits to producers, to consumers and countries alike. The hope is that African producers would benefit from access to cheaper inputs and intermediate goods, as well as larger markets for their products, while consumers have access to cheaper goods and a broader variety of products. On their part, African economies should experience some gains from trade and further benefit from removing some of the more onerous requirements of belonging to multiple and overlapping trade agreements within the continent. The Economic Commission for Africa has estimated that with full liberalization, intra-African trade will increase by 52.3% as compared to a situation without the free trade agreements. This will be by 2022. Such an increase means that African economies will benefit from the growth that often accompanies increased trade flows. First, and I think the very first, uh, the, the first question that we ought to address is, where are we in the journey uh, with the uh, African Continental Free Trade Agreements? Where exactly are we today in that journey? It's probably worth noting that Nigeria played a very active role in the negotiations that brought the Free Trade Agreement into being. And the main intensive stages were chaired by the late Ambassador Chiedu Osakwe, who was then the Director General of the Nigeria Office for Trade Negotiations. The creation of the Office of Trade Negotiations was a deliberate decision by this government to change our approach to trade negotiations by ensuring that our participation is underpinned by top class technical knowledge and adequate preparations. A considerable amount of work had been done before the suspension of activities uh, relating to the operationalization of the free trade agreement. Work was ongoing on the schedule of tariff concessions for trading goods and trading services and for rules of origin. For instance, it had been agreed that the schedule of tariff concessions would permit 10% of tariff lines of member states to be included in an exclusion list that is not subject to liberalization and a sensitive products list which is subject to negotiated liberalization. Just, just, just to uh, emphasize the point, it, they, they, uh, the member states agreed that 10% of tariff lines, 10% of items could come under a, a special category, an exclusion list. So for example, if we felt that we didn't want uh, to liberalize trade in rice, as an example, or trade in, in soya beans or trade in sorghum, we could put it under that 
uh, tariff line, which will not be subject, it will be an exclusion list, and it will not be subject to liberalization. There's also a sensitive products list, uh, which is a list that we would agree to negotiate liberalization. In other words, it would not be automatic liberalization, would agree to negotiate. Well, the, the, these um, sorts of checks and, 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 and assurances are put into the trade agreement to, to assure member states that you can, where necessary, protect certain items. You can decide as a matter of economic policy that you want to specialize in certain items or you want, to, you, you, you want certain items to be protected from competition, from external competition. And that is factored into the uh, that, that is factored into the trade agreements. Also, five sectors have been identified as the initial priorities for negotiations in trade services. And these five sectors are transport, communications, tourism, financial services, and business services. I just repeat that transport, communications, financial services, tourism, and business services. Similarly, product specific rules of origin have been agreed on 88% of product lines with work on key products like cotton, textiles, sugar, and automobiles still outstanding before the delays occasioned by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So we have 88% of product lines which have been agreed, uh, on, uh, the rules of origin have been agreed with respect to 88% of, of product lines. Now, these rules of origin, as you know, are very important, you know, because one of the chief fears of those who uh, have opposed the trade agreements is that what stops uh, a country, a neighboring country, say Benin Republic or Togo, from bringing in a Chinese uh, firm, a Chinese company that will simply establish itself uh, there in the country and begin to sell its products, manufacture some products and sell those products under the free trade agreements, you know, just using Togo as a staging post or using Benin as a staging post, you know, and just transferring this, uh, and simply selling the goods to Nigeria. Or what stops any other country that just wants to sell its products and benefit from uh, the free trade agreement, from coming into any of our neighboring countries and establishing there and simply selling products. So the rules of origin have taken care of that with respect to 88% of products to ensure that we are very clear as to rules of origin. Where, where the goods are originally manufactured is important in the free trade agreement. If they are not originally manufactured in the country, uh, in, in one of our member state countries, then clearly they cannot benefit from the free trade agreement. Now, all this work was disrupted by the outbreak of the pandemic but it's essential to reach agreement on them before actual trading can start, as specific details are required so that customs and uh, customs authorities can make necessary changes and adjustments to their tariff books. Trading was supposed to start on the 1st of July 2020, but the takeoff date has now uh, been shifted to the 1st of January 2021. So virtual meetings, uh, at the moment, what is going on are virtual meetings of trade negotiators, senior officials, and even ministers. And many of these meetings have been held to keep up the momentum. But of course, it seems that they are faced with several challenges in communications. In many cases, they are bandwidth problems, you know, uh, reliability. And in some cases, you know, there's some worry about confidentiality in those transactions. And this, you know, has somewhat hampered uh, the virtual meetings. All these outstanding, uh, all these outstanding phase one issues would need to be completed before negotiations move to phase two, which will deal with uh, the substantive issues of competition policy, intellectual property, and investment. And and this is in, this is important. You know, the phase two is is important because this is one of the very important innovations in the free trade agreements: competition policy, intellectual property, and investment. Usually. Trade agreements uh, under the WTO tradition don't necessarily include competition policy, intellectual property, and investment rules, etc. But these particular trade agreements are in the modern genre of trade agreements. And you have a lot of, you know, and we're paying considerable attention to competition policy, to intellectual property, and to investment rules. 
The immediate challenge is to bring our economies back to normalcy across the continent. And although Africa has been relatively fortunate in terms of the actual health damage of the pandemic, our business and trading populations will need assurances of safety from the virus before normal economic activity nationally and regionally will return to normal. Besides, it will be difficult to restore full economic activities without facing the dangers of a second wave and further economic disruption. So business as usual, it seems, will only return with the availability of a vaccine. And, uh, or perhaps, uh, as some have suggested, if, if the, if the uh, virus were just simply to disappear one day. But even, but even this may, uh, like trade, even this prospect of a vaccine and the use of a vaccine may, like trade, be affected by the power configurations uh, between the global south, just roughly speaking, and the north, and between the wealthier countries and uh, we uh, countries that are poorer. Today, one of our concerns in Africa is that because the wealthier countries have literally prepaid for the earlier supplies of the vaccines, it might take a while for us to get immunized in this uh, part of the world. Definitely, we are a Gavi-supported country, and we are actively involved in Gavi's efforts to ensure equitable global access to COVID-19 vaccines under the COVAX initiative. Isn't it interesting that uh, we have to talk now about a vaccine as part of trade, as part of our economy, you know, and the availability of a vaccine, because if it's not available, we, we, we may indeed, you know, uh, have further disruptions in, our, in economic activity. Just to explain, COVAX, COVAX is the vaccine spiller of, uh, of uh, a project which is called the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator. And it's co-led by the Coalition of Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, uh, CEPI, Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, and the World Health Organization. And they are working in partnership with developed and developing country vaccine manufacturers. So it is, uh, this is a global initiative that is working with governments and manufacturers to ensure that COVID-19 vaccines are available worldwide to both higher income and lower income countries. So this is, uh, a, 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 this is an alliance that we're working very closely with uh, so that we also will be able to get uh, COVID-19 vaccines at about the same time as other countries are getting it, or at least shortly thereafter. The challenge of rebuilding our economies is a real one. And we had identified this as a major issue as we entered into the uh, free trade agreements. Even, you know, in, in other words, even before COVID-19, obviously, uh, rebuilding our economies and, and uh, growing our economies has always been uh, an, an important consideration. Infrastructure, for example, access to capital have remained challenges. Uh, GDP growth was minus 6.1% in the second quarter of 2020. Uh, in South Africa, which is the second uh, largest uh, economy, uh, in, 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 uh, which is the second largest economy in, on the continent, GDP has contracted by 51% in the same period. So we are, you know, uh, so we are faced with uh, severe challenges, with, 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 with considerable challenges, and we must uh, address those challenges. It's obvious that if uh, there is no production, there's very little scope for growth. But lack of growth and volatile macroeconomic conditions also pose a great danger to the free trade agreements because the instinct of countries is to look inwards and to resort to beggar by neighbor policies, such as competitive devaluation, tariff barriers, when faced with such difficulties. Here in Nigeria, the approach that we have adopted is uh, a 2.3 trillion economic sustainability plan with a view to mitigating the shock uh, tackling vulnerabilities and creating and protecting jobs, rescuing businesses and repositioning the economy. Our projections showed that without the stimulus, the economy was set to contract by about minus 4.4% and possibly up to you know, seven, uh, almost possibly up to 7% in 2020. But with implementation, including ramping up local production, 
we should be able to limit the negative growth to about minus 0.59%. Let me be clear that our desire to ramp up local production is not a call to alter key, but rather an expenditure switching approach which can complement the free trade agreement's desire to deepen uh, regional value chains. Indeed, one thing that has become clear from our experiences of the last few months is the need for a vibrant and successful free trade agreement. The pandemic has exposed our dependence on commodity exports to other parts of the world and on the import of manufactured goods from them. As at 2017, intra-African trade in goods was in the order of about $135 billion, $135 billion US dollars, which was about 15% of Africa's total trade. This is in sharp contrast to trade in other regions, which is as high as 70% in the European Union and 60% in the Asia uh, uh, trade agreements. The imposition of export bans, including on food items by some countries, and the disruption of the global supply chains at the height of the pandemic showed just how exposed and vulnerable Afri African countries are because of the limited productive capacity and a lack of regional uh, value chains. So, we, so, so, so these are, uh, are issues that we, 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 we simply have to deal with, you know, and I think that the pandemic has helped greatly in showing us these vulnerabilities and that we simply must improve our current situations and we must, and we must ensure that we fully implement the trade agreements to enable us interact, you know, uh, with our neighbors uh, by way of trade. We must, of course, continue to bear in mind, especially here in Nigeria, of course, that uh, the uh, free trade agreements will not, of course, automatically bring about growth and prosperity. The reality is that if care is not taken, trade liberalization can expose the Nigerian economy to unfair competition and sharp trade practices with adverse consequences for our producers who might have to close down their businesses and for our workers who will then lose their jobs. So it's a double-edged sword. But of course, the, 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 the better picture is that these trade agreements are, uh, will inspire growth, will, will, will definitely serve our purposes, but we need to be proactive if we are to participate effectively uh, in them. This will entail improving our ability to produce and trade competitively in goods and services, which is why the federal government is investing heavily in infrastructure, road, rail, port infrastructure, and of course, our broadband connectivity. We're hoping that uh, our broadband for all by 2023 will work. Uh, and this is a very important part of our infrastructure. And so we're talking to states, to state governments, uh, to reduce their tariffs or completely erase um, right-of-way tariffs that they impose on broadband infrastructure. And of course, the argument is that if uh, there are no right-of-way tariffs and uh, private sector individuals can lay their broadband infrastructure, it will be much, it, obviously the economic benefits are greater than whatever uh, little uh, IGR can be derived from uh, uh, right of way charges on broadband infrastructure. So these are some of the uh, infrastructure initiatives that we think are crucial to being able to benefit maximally from the free trade agreements. It's also why we are taking active steps to improve the business environment and to facilitate trade across our borders, including through the implementation of the national trading platform or the single windows project. Uh, part of that project is the installation of scanners in all of our ports, seaports, airports, and uh, our land borders as well. The national trading platform is a very important part of our preparations for the AFCTA. Uh, this, uh, involves, uh, a border, uh, this involves a ports community project. Of course, there's a customs uh, aspect of it. And, and this is particularly crucial because it means that all of our trade uh, imports and exports and all of our trade will come through a single platform which of course is technologically powered and it's an electronic platform it will enable us to skip a lot of the processes that slow down imports uh, 
uh, a lot of the processes that make uh, trading, export and import difficult, tracking cargo, inspecting cargo, etc., will uh, become much, much easier, especially because of the benefit of technology. Just about two weeks ago, the Federal Executive Council uh, approved an important aspect of it, of the trading platform, which is the custom segment of it, the customs electronic platform. And we hope that um, we would be able to achieve this in, in, the next two, uh, in the next two years. We hope we'll be able to achieve the full implementation of the national trading platform. Government also realizes, of course, that it needs to be able to enforce trade rules and apply trade remedies so that our partners in the uh, free trade agreements, especially our neighbors, don't take undue advantage of our large market. We appreciate that the border closure, for example, has caused difficulties, um, not just for our neighbors, but for many of our businesses. And, and as you probably have heard, uh, active steps have been taken to resolve the situation especially by consulting closely with neighboring uh, and proximate countries to address the issues of concern to us, especially on brittle smuggling uh, into the country. Uh, you probably also uh, wish to know that the National Action Committee of the implementation of the Free Trade Agreement, which is chaired by our own uh, Honorable Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment, is already actively seized uh, with these matters. So if the AFTA is to achieve the desired objectives, then it's also very important that Nigeria should push for the implementation of complementary programs and protocols, including the protocol on free movement of persons, the Pan-African payment systems, and the sectoral program, and the other sectoral programs. Quite unlike the free trade agreement, the protocol on free movement of persons is not gathering the desired pace of ratification. And this is not surprising because of the fear of uh, migrants outcompeting nationals for jobs and the likely social tensions in recipient countries. We already see the kinds of tensions that are going on in Ghana with, our, with uh, Nigerian businesses. You know. So you can, it then becomes easier to understand why the protocols on free movement of persons is not uh, being taken on as enthusiastically as uh, the other components of, of our free trade agreements. There's always that tension, always that sense that foreigners would come and take over our jobs, foreigners will come and take over everything that we own. But the truth is that free movement of persons is key for trade. There's no, we, we have no choice. If we're going to implement the free trade agreements, we must have free movement of persons especially trade in services such as tourism, professional services and all that, you know, then it stands to reason that the success of the trade agreement itself in the medium term would require a faster rate of ratification and implementation of the protocol on uh, free movement of persons. Similarly, the establishment of the Pan-African Payments and Settlements Platform by the Afri Exim Bank, long way, to in creating the desired continental payment systems and in enabling cross-border informal trade, which is estimated to be about $93 billion per annum. So there's no question at all that, you know, the African Free Trade Agreement by itself is, it cannot, work as it, uh, cannot work effectively without these other protocols and these other systems, the protocol on free movement, uh, the protocol, and then the continental payment systems, um, which we hope, uh, which AFRIEXIM is promoting. In the area of health, the COVID-19 crisis has shown the importance of regional co cooperation to come up with a continental resilience strategy to cope with similar shocks in the future. A good example of this is the African Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, this is using digitally pooled procurement systems to order for chemical reagents, diagnostic and medical equipment. And this is important because orders for test kits and health equipment by African countries tended to be small and ignored at the height of the crisis. So because we're able to pool our resources as African countries together and buy in bulk, you know, we cannot be ignored. But as individual countries, because our orders tended to be small, we could be completely ignored. 
So this cooperation is one that, you know, has yielded tremendous fruit. And again, is one, if you like, of the uh, silver linings in the very dark cloud of the COVID-19 pandemic. Successful implementation of the trade agreement requires financing to address various implementation challenges and to promote arrangements in support of integration. For instance, in addition to making up for potential losses of tariff revenues, African countries will face implementation costs, including undertaking reforms, establishing new trade-related bodies, improving and upgrading existing facilities, etc. In addition to these domestic measures, there are also costs associated with establishing uh, the Secretariat, the CFTA Secretariat, and, the, uh, and building regional infrastructure. Finding the resources to undertake these activities at a time like this, when uh, practically every country lacks uh, fiscal space, will of course prove to be very difficult for Nigeria and other African countries. And I'd like to uh, urge our economists uh, to help with innovative financing solutions for some of our economies. One important objective of the free trade agreements is to overcome the economic fragmentation of the continent by bringing the regional economic blocks together in a common agreement. This being the case, African countries should look to negotiating trade treaties with other parts of the world on the basis of the free trade agreements rather than through arbitrarily designed regional blocks. The, 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 the truth is that we should not allow ourselves to be lured into our, our arrangements we do not serve our long-term development objectives. Now that we have the free trade agreements, it's, it's, uh, the African free trade agreement, it's important that we don't go back to our ECOWAS agreements, to COMESA, and all these other regional blocks. And if we start, because if we start negotiating along the same old regional blocks, the major advantage of the African Free Trade Agreement will be lost because we'll be fractionalized again, we'll be fragmented again, and we'll not gain the benefit of, uh, of this, of being the largest free trade agreement in the entire world. The African Free Trade Agreement is the largest. Uh, so we are dealing with the largest trade area in the entire world. So there, there are huge advantages, and one of the key uh, points for African countries to note is that we mustn't go back to the regional, to our old regional trading blocks and arrangements and negotiate on that basis. We'll certainly will be shortchanging, shortchanging ourselves. In summary then, apart from reducing the spread of COVID-19 and mitigating its effect on the domestic economy, Nigeria must have an interest in promoting a trade agreement, the African trade agreement, that catalyzes regional value chains, enables free movement of people, and attracts investments and improves the continental payment systems. As we seek to use the opportunities, we must remain alert to the need to create conditions that will enable our businesses to, better able, uh, to be better able to compete and to thrive within the free, uh, African free trade area. I, I think this is particularly important, you know, because <clears throat> being the biggest economy, we have leverage. We have leverage not just in negotiations, we have leverage in in our own, in our size of, of the cake. And so, with, so, so for this reason, we owe ourselves as a country a responsibility of ensuring that we create the right circumstances for maximally benefiting from the free trade agreements. And, and this is, the, and this is uh, a task not just for the present government, but for governments in the future, because a trade agreement, of course, is dynamic, it's evolving, and there will always be challenges and our economies must respond to it. As a matter of fact, we must begin to think and plan, budget planning, uh, economic planning must take into account the AFCTA, which is why uh, the, our, our new uh, successor plan to the Economic Recovery and Growth Plan is one that will take into account uh, uh, the issues around the, uh, the African Continental Free Trade Agreements because we can no longer plan without uh, taking into account the free trade agreements. In closing, permit me to uh, make uh, to digress slightly and to <clears throat> make 
Uh, and to make this call to the Nigerian Economic Society to be more engaged in public policy debates. I find that very often uh, some public commentators make assertions that have no basis in economic theory or practice. And because they dominate the public space, they contribute to public misunderstanding of economic principles and their application to public policy. Once the experts, uh, like the distinguished assemblage here, do not contribute to public debate, then the place is left open to charlatans. And in the era of social media, there is a lot of noise going on, a lot of misinformation, a lot of misadvice and all of that. I know that there are, of course, doctrinal differences and that not every academic economist uh, will write in a newspaper column or will, is even interested. I, I know that academics generally may even consider it uh, beneath them to write, uh, to do newspaper columns. But I'm told that Milton Friedman uh, wrote a regular column in the Newsweek magazine and that Paul Krugman, who is uh, of an entirely different economic persuasion, continues to write for the New York Times. Today, I do not think we can afford to leave the space. The way that communications is, is going on the, and the rapid way in which ideas have been transferred and which ideas have been transmitted, we, cannot, we simply cannot afford to leave the space and write only in academic journals. So some of us should take up the gauntlet and help to shape an informed and reasoned national discourse on the economy. I, I must again thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to this distinguished gathering of economists of our country. I thank you very much and I wish you very well. Thank you.